Hello, I'm Rachel Babin from Oncology News Australia, proud producers of the Oncology Journal Club podcast and the OJC Meets. Welcome to another entertaining and informative podcast. Today's special episode is a tweetorial dedicated to oncology ontology and Twitter hashtags. Eva Segaloff and Craig Underhill meet Matthew Katz and Andrew Parsonson. How did this episode come about? Well, Andrew tweeted asking for advice on cancer tag ontology. Matthew Katz recently published a paper on organizing online health content. And with the power of Twitter and the OJC, we've brought them together to have a chat. So if you have a question for us, please don't hesitate to get in touch. We'll do our best to answer or find the person best place to answer for you. As ever, you'll find links to all of the papers, bios and Twitter handles in the notes on our website. For regular news and podcast updates, subscribe to the Oncology Newsletter on oncologynews.com.au. It's free and it's a great way to support the OJC. This is Rachel Babin and this is the Oncology Podcast. G'day, 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 and g'day, four g'days, because this is going to be a fantastic potty because it's all about hashtags and Twitter. And everyone knows, Craig, that we love talking about Twitter, although we don't really know very much about it. That's right. So I think this is a really great opportunity to learn a bit more. So Eva, I'm really looking forward to this um, next paper we're going to do. So it's a really quirky way that we came about doing this segment, right? Well, you know, Craig, we're real Twitter heads ever since we started hashtag OJC. And lo and behold, up on Twitter comes up at AO Parsonson replying to at Craig Underhill at Oncology News Australia and at Prof Eva Segalov. And it says, long time listener, first time tweeter at Craig Underhill. I need to get my head around cancer tag ontology and the best ways to increase the reach of a funny and insightful hashtag meded podcast and attached a paper. And that paper is what we were going to look at in this podcast, JCO, Clinical Cancer Informatics, called Organising Online Health Content, Developing Hashtag Collections for Healthier Internet-Based People and Communities. Wow, we thought that's a bit of a challenge. And then up pops on Twitter some guy called Matthew Katz, MD, with a little American (laughs) flag, (laughs) at Subatomic Doc. And replies and says, any questions, feel free to let me know. Smiley thumbs up. So who's this? Well, none other than the first author of that very paper. And so, Andrew, we're so thrilled that you asked this question of us, that we have a very special guest here to answer all of your questions on oncology ontology. So just to explain, we asked Andrew to come on to review the paper and then we got Matthew on to answer any questions about the paper and talk a bit about this whole field. So, Andrew, you're a fellow at Nepean Hospital Medical Oncology in Sydney. That's right, Craig. Yeah. And Matthew, you're a community oncologist in Massachusetts, if I got that right. And you're also on, explain a little bit, you're also on ASCO Social Media Working Group. Yes. Yeah. So I'm a community radiation oncologist. I practice in two hospitals in Lowell, uh, Massachusetts, and in Manchester, New Hampshire. And I've just been volunteering essentially through professional societies to participate in social media. Fantastic. Do you know I've actually been to Manchester, New Hampshire? Oh, have you? Yeah, yeah, but that was in England. No, no, no. Manchester, New Hampshire. So my sister in law lives in New York, in um, Brooklyn. And we've driven a couple of times up through New Hampshire to Vermont. So we've been through Manchester a couple of times. So there you go. That's of no interest to anyone, Oh, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) But what I'm interested in is, Matt, it's fantastic. Welcome to hashtag OJC. 
because I want to learn as much from this as I'm sure Andrew does. So, Andrew, tell us about your tweet, your plea for oncology ontology. Thanks, Eva. Yeah. So, um, as you know, I'm not a seasoned Twitter veteran like, like you and Craig. I'm very, very new to the, the med Twitter community. But, you know, going on there, I found that there's so much information, you know, so much good material out there, but it's all very fleeting. It's all very uh, temporary. And I found that there's really no good way of sort of sieving through and finding information. And it's really difficult knowing where to start. And so, Having a quick sort of look through the internet, I found and came across this paper that mentioned, written by Matt, and I noticed a lot of the, the Twitter posts that we came across had this SM root uh, attached to it. So some, something like LCSM, like lung cancer, social media. And I realized it was all, all sort of stemmed from a number of people that started these hashtags over in the US. So just quickly summing up the paper, basically it first started in, in 2009 with the healthcare communications and social media hashtag or HCSM. And that was the first global healthcare Twitter chat. And from there, a few years later, the disease specific chat started. So BCSM, the breast cancer social media chat that was started by two breast cancer advocates, Alicia Staley and, and Jody Schroger. And later, hashtag BTSM or brain tumor uh, social media. And my understanding is that uh, inspired by this, two authors, including Matt, uh, saw the potential to broaden uh, this concept. And he curated a number of hashtags for different types of cancers uh, that's been uh, coined, I guess, and referred to as the cancer tag ontology, so O-N-T-O-L-O-G-Y, which is, a, I had to look this up, a structured system of formal naming and, and categories, and all using a sort of similar naming system based on the disease group followed by the SM suffix. And Matt goes on to sort of outline his experience from 2011 to 2017 on how this ontology grew and how they uh, developed, I guess, some guidelines on sustaining these Twitter communities and really helping to organize and increase awareness of each sort of leader in each field so that patients, you know, advocates, healthcare professionals can really connect to and follow information of interest on a global level. Hey, well done. That was absolutely fascinating. I'm so excited about this because I'm just a fake on Twitter and I rarely use hashtags because I don't really understand them. And now we've got the chief, I don't mean to insult you, but nerd or what's the word for someone who, who knows so much about Twitter? Nerd is appropriate, I think. So how'd you get into it, Matt? Well, I started tinkering with social media around 2006 and ended up eventually migrating to Twitter from some other platforms. And I set up my account in like 2009, but didn't really use it till 2010. And it was right around then that a lot of people in healthcare, some early adopters, all were trying to learn from each other and find ways to interact. And it was pretty common, particularly since at the time, the impression of Twitter was it was like a cocktail party, that people would have one hour chats and discuss a topic. And Dana Lewis set up this one around health communications. Uh, she had worked in communications in Seattle, Washington. And that had been a great model for getting a feel for how to have a live discussion with people from your home. With that, it was two breast cancer patients and advocates who then said, why don't we do this for a specific disease? And I was fortunate enough to participate in that because I knew both of them through this original chat, 4th of July, 2011. So it's been a decade now that it's been around. And it was just amazing. It gave me a tremendous feeling of insights into the little things that people think about, but you don't have time to discuss in an office visit. And I found it uh, just unbelievable. And it was a very supportive group. It was inclusive for both patients, caregivers, professionals, and I just enjoyed participating in it. And it was only as time went on that I realized that there might be some potential in it when I saw a separate group spontaneously adopt this for brain tumors. And then in about 2013, it just sort of 
came to a head where one of the people from HCSM that I knew, the original group, who was a medical librarian, Patricia Anderson at University of Michigan, we said, well, why doesn't everybody have this? And so that was what inspired starting tinkering with coming up with this hashtag system. It's actually amazing, isn't it? But when you say it's a group, what do you mean it's a group? Because just explains how hashtags work. Say, not for me, but Craig doesn't really understand it. Oh, no problem. I, I just thought you were misspelling oncology when you put up a bad oncology. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've seen the hashtag. I've only been on Twitter for 12 months and I've seen these hashtags, hashtag oncology. It's pretty straightforward. But I've seen like the BTSM and wondered what they were. So it was actually, I'm really glad that Andrew pointed this paper out and, of course, really thrilled as well, Matt, that you've come on to explain it. But I like the cocktail party concept. I like a cocktail party, but I like the dipping in and out of Twitter. But if you do want to search stuff, this is how you do it, right? It definitely helps. So when you have a hashtag with any string of terms after it, as long as it's letters, usually it will allow you to then filter things by that in the search for anything on Twitter. And so you can use that for chat. You can use it to find health information. And so what this has sort of evolved into separate from the chats is continuous use that allows you to sort of have like an interactive radio station that it's not something that necessarily is intuitive. But for example, you know, WBUR is public radio on the radio. In this case, on something like Twitter or social media, you can put in BCSM and it will give you information about breast cancer. It's not the only way to search for it and it's not intuitive. So people don't automatically know about it. But as you all have come across it, so have others. And the hope is that it creates a little bit of curation of content so that it's not just a constant stream of information, but hopefully something that actually provides a little knowledge and a little bit of more reliable health information. And given some of the issues we've all seen with misinformation online, it has some value, just depends how it's implemented. Hey, Craig, I've yes, just either. looked up, I've just looked up Matthew on Twitter. And do you know how many followers he's got? Well, I was going to point this out. So now that you're on the topic, I've actually looked it up before we came on air. He's got 19.9 thousand and Eva, you have 673. I know. So I've now I'm in front of you. I'm so proud of that. 681 in 12 months. And Andrew's just started on Twitter and he's up to 64, which is fantastic, Andrew. I'm sure, you know, you're going to go viral now, Andrew. After this show, we'll put the hashtags on your Twitter handle on the podcast notes. I think that's one of the issues about these hashtags, right? They actually do increase your reach and probably give you some authenticity in the professional space if you're using these hashtags. Is that right? I think it helps to a point, but I think the more important part is using it to interact with people, not just to try to broadcast. The key is finding people with similar interests who then you actually can have a conversation with. So yeah, I have a lot of followers, uh, but I have been doing this now for a decade. So that does help. And it was something because I was an early adopter, it's allowed me to have a higher number of followers. More important to me than the followers really is, again, the interactions I have for discussions. It's a matter of finding sort of what your purpose is to be on Twitter first. And then from there, sort of exploring and finding people that you find are worth talking to. There's only so much time in the day, so it's only worth doing it if it adds something, I think, to your overall quality of life and to your practice of medicine. So I've got a question for you, Matt, and I'm so in awe of you, really. You are Twitter royalty. But do you follow Craig? I'm not sure. (laughs) I'm not sure because I've interacted with you all. It's something that I may be doing that, but I honestly have no idea at the moment I could check. (laughs) No, but how did you come across Andrew's question? Is it that every time, you know, somebody quotes that paper, you've got an alert or you just happen to pop up an answer? Actually, yes. So what happens is Altmetric, which tracks social media activity, sends me a message when something has been tweeted about the article. So I don't always check it, but I happen to look and that's how I came across it. Matthew, do you have to register on Altometric 
for it to send you messages or? I think I did sign up for it and then it knew that I was the author for it. So I think when that was published, it allowed me to connect it to Altmetric. That's amazing. So, Andrew, here is your chance. You have Twitter mm. royalty here. Ask away. I do. I'm very excited. <laughs> so, I guess, Matt, I mean, you've been doing this for 10 years, and I think in your paper you did sort of comment on a number of sort of challenges of maintaining sort of these communities, and you sort of pointed out that you often does need a champion or a leader to sort of drive a lot of these communities. Can you comment a bit about your experiences over the last few 10 years? Yeah, so I think as we sort of initially talked about, my initial experience was just this sort of perfect timing of developing this. And in terms of the term ontology, the reason we used it was partly because most of social media uses what's called a folksonomy, people tagging things on their own and creating sort of a grassroots type organization to it, whereas an ontology is sort of like the Dewey Decimal System for the library. It's a structured system that's top down, which most people feel does not work in social media. So it's already sort of a challenge for using it, but we just were fortunate enough we had the right people looking to do this at the same time. And so for LCSM in 2013, it just so happened they had been thinking about this just as we were developing the hashtag system. And so they adopted it, as did a gynecologic group who chose for experience, for patient experience, to sort of pool everything together rather than having separate cervical and ovarian cancer groups. So they sort of had this spontaneous life of their own, but maintaining that's very difficult. Pancreatic chat uh, died out and was not used after a while. They found something else was more useful for discussing pancreatic cancer. One of the two people who founded the breast cancer group unfortunately had a recurrence of breast cancer and died. And that had an impact on the tone and the continuity of the group. It has still actually maintained a weekly chat and has done a brilliant job of doing that because of Alicia Staley and the amazing amount of support she's gotten for the group. But it is a lot of time to be putting into maybe organizing these. And when you have turnover, either because people get sick or ill, or they have other interests that they develop, it's really hard to keep people's attention. And there's a little bit of attention deficit disorder anyway in dealing with social media. So it makes it, I think, particularly difficult. Another problem can be trying to attract people to it. You don't know about these hashtags unless you see it. And that also has been a limitation. For the most part, we haven't had spam as an issue from what we've seen for most of the groups, but it depends partly on activity or if you stumble across something. So those are a few of them. I think there are a lot. Are there any other specific ones you have a question about or that I can answer anything about? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, one of your interests, I think, Matt, looking through uh, some of your other papers really is sort of patient education, you know, empowerment. Have you ever recommended to a patient to join Twitter or join one of these live tweets in your practice before? I have not, no. So I think the people who go online, there's a selection bias for who is there already and who's willing to share information. And I never encourage anyone to go online because you're going to be giving away personal data. So my hope is that as we learn a little bit more, the default can be a little bit safer for people online, but right now it's not. And so I think for now, I don't recommend anyone go online. I do ask my patients if they are using certain websites and do sort of a health information review of systems to know where people get their information, not specifically to know how they use social media, but to just see where they get their information sources since people don't rely on physicians as much as they did before. So I've got millions of questions, Matt, but we've got ESMO coming up shortly. We've had ASCO and I did a little tutorial on how to use the hashtags and I'm sorry, I failed it. So can you uh, try again to explain to me what's the best way to use the hashtags during a meeting like ASCO or ESMO? So it depends if you're trying to live tweet what's happening at the meeting 
and the degree to which you want to be sort of a commentator as opposed to actually trying to take in information and learn. I don't know that you can do both at the same time. So when I've attended some of ASCO's meetings, I've live tweeted and you know combined actually using my phone for screenshots to tweet things and to have other things that I will type up. It's a little bit frenetic, actually, if you try to tweet too much. So I'm not sure that that is as interesting to me as time has gone on as the interactive part. And, you know, seeing who else is at the meeting right now, we're not attending in person because of COVID. But when we were, it would be a good way to see if someone was there at the meeting that I could meet up with. So I found that helpful. So networking can be another use for it. But it's also making sure you're using the correct hashtag. There have been a number of times where the professional society will use, like for 2021, they would use just 21 after ESMO. And some other people will use 2021 and then it splits where everybody goes. So it's it's not always easy. I do find if you are either on mobile or on desktop, you can just go to Twitter itself. The other option is, have you used TweetDeck at all? Oh, Craig's a TweetDeck man, yeah. Yeah, I've used it at, you know, at my desktop at home, and I think during ASCO it was actually useful because you could set up a few hashtags that you wanted to follow, and it gives you, you know, people who aren't aware, it sort of sets it up on a screen on your web browser, and it has columns so you can see you can follow like ESCO 21, like you said, or, you know, colon cancer or oncology or whatever. And, you know, you can actually see things as they go. And of course you follow, you can follow your own account or whatever and see the interactions and it's all there. So that's quite a good way. Once you, it takes a little bit getting used to, I think, but you can customize it. And so that's quite a good way during the meeting. I just found in general, I think Twitter is the, you know, where people go for current information, new information. So I think it comes into its fore during meetings like ASCO and ESMO because you can go, like for us to we're in a different time zone, right? So you can get up the next morning and go, oh, I wonder what happened in the GI session. And you can have a look and you can see what the most, you know, popular tweets or topics are. And you do get a pretty quick feel for what was interesting or controversial in that session, then you can go in and actually look at the detail, you know, on the ASCO website or whatever. So I think as a sort of a news, a way to get news, it's great. And you can also use two hashtags in the search function so that if you want to look at it, you know, ASCO 21 and limit it just to lung cancer, you could put in the hashtag ASCO 21 and then the other hashtag LCSM and it will filter it out just to that disease track. So dual hashtags, it's just another filter. So Matt, it says on your profile you're a dad. How old are your kids? 20, 18, and 18. Okay, twins, I presume, Matt. Yes, yep. just about to get them <laughs> out to college. So. Fantastic. <laughs> so they will never have used Twitter if they're like my children. Twitter is for old farts, no one of that era will go on Twitter. Is that true? And if so, Andrew, are you sort of being a bit intergenerational here? I think I definitely fit into that intergenerational section, (laughs) Eva, although I am a millennial by definition. Yeah, my kids don't use it that much. They're more into Instagram and Snapchat primarily, but they do have Twitter accounts. They just don't use them. But that's exactly the same as my kids. So why aren't we on Instagram and what is better about Twitter for medical information? That's a good question. I'm not sure. I do think it depends what kind of medical information you're talking about. I think radiology has actually had some good success because it's visual for Instagram. I think, it again, each platform has its strengths and weaknesses. Twitter is great for live information but it's ephemeral and it does go by quickly and there's not really a good way to store stuff that's immediately intuitive. There are ways to do it, but not easy. I think it just seems right now that this has been a good place for many doctors and other healthcare providers to come, but it's not the only place. And so I think part of what I've done is this fits what my interests are more than other platforms. 
at a certain point, you know, you only have so much time you have to decide what is going to be the best fit. And so part of it is understanding what plays to your strengths. So there are some people that are very good on Instagram. I don't know who they are. So my next question is to Andrew. Andrew, what are you going to do having read this article? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, I mean, from myself personally, I'm very cognizant that, you know, when I am tweeting out, you know, whether it be someone else's paper or, or some piece of, of research that I'm putting out there, that I do want to try to increase the reach. And I think using these, using these hashtags is a really good and easy way, you know, of doing so. You feel, I mean, a little bit like an imposter in some ways that sort of you using these hashtags that, you know, big institutions and, and organizations use. But in some ways, it's, it's quite satisfying, I guess, you know, that you're putting it out there and it's quite democratizing that it sort of brings everyone to the same sort of level playing field that anyone can really use these and sort of put it out there into the world. Obviously, I don't have 20,000 followers like Matthew does. <laughs> it's not quite the same reach, but it's, yeah, no, it's still a very fun experience, I think, in the last few weeks that I've been on Twitter and something that I'm certainly you know, telling my colleagues and you know other trainees you know to do because I think it's a really good sort of community to get quick information. We're all time poor and sort of catching up and staying up with the latest information in particularly like you're saying from conferences and you know, meetings and things like that. Yeah, I guess that's a great point because I tweet something out and Twitter makes you feel like you're connecting with everyone in the world. But if you actually look at the stats, maybe one person interacted or saw it, and that's usually Craig, and then he tweets me back. So you think you're in this global sort of thing, but by putting this hashtag, you instantly connect to how many people, Matt? Do you have some ideas? I don't. I will say that despite the high follower count, I am much less good at tweeting things that pop like some people in oncology. Part of that is by design, I think. I don't necessarily look to try to get a sort of viral tweet out there. What I've found is it's been more helpful for me to make these meaningful connections. I would not be publishing articles like this if it weren't for getting to interact with the people that I did this paper with, some of whom I've still never met in person, and we've only known each other through Twitter. And so it is something that for my co-authors, uh, Patricia Anderson being second author in this case, without her guidance on how to do this, I wouldn't have been able to do this. And so I just try to find interesting things. And then I prefer asking questions and discussions. But often if I put something out there, it just doesn't interest people. And I'm fine with that. Some people are very good at you know hitting the right tone, but unfortunately, often the right tone is anger. And that's not what I'm looking to put online. So, Hey, Matt, you're such a nice guy. You're such a Thank nice, you. humble American. <laughs> <laughs> you can come well, on anytime. Thank you. Well, I mean, the, the way I look at this is it's an amazing medium. We don't know how to use it well, and particularly in healthcare, we've got certain responsibilities to other people to do things well. And so the term I've used for this, for what I do, is legacy tweeting, at some point, I'll be dead, and my family's going to wonder what I did spending my time online. And so I limit what I do to if it seems worthwhile. Well, well done. Oh, thank you. But again, I've learned from some other really good people online as well to see what to do. So what's your advice to Andrew? He's just starting out. He's found your hashtags. I would start by finding people and or organizations that you genuinely trust. And just start with following them and getting a feel for what they do. And then from there, you'll see sort of who they're connected with that seem reliable to get to know and what interest there may be. And as I think I mentioned earlier, you know, find a purpose. What is worthwhile being online that complements what you already do to help people offline and is worth your time? And then just try to focus on that and not everything because there's too much to do online. The other part is, as much as it's nice to see something get more shares, it is addictive and it is a dopamine hit and avoid it. <laughs> it's a trap. That's good advice. I think that was advice for you, Craig, not for Andrew. Oh, oh, well yeah. done, Matt. <laughs> <laughs>
So Matt, I think another one of the aspects of Twitter that I've come across is the tweetorials. Can you comment a bit about that and whether you think it's helpful? Yeah, I think tweetorials are helpful in some respects to organize thoughts, particularly if it is something that does require a little bit more than the 280 characters that you get to discuss a topic. I do think it takes a fair amount of choreography to string them together, and it's beyond sort of my skill set to do that. It's also something that I think there's a little bit of use of it as a bully pulpit and not as much for interaction as for establishing authority. So I haven't found that that's been my area of interest. I've got a counter to that, which is more question-based, which is Socra tweets. The idea being that you can ask questions and use that as a way for teaching and learning, but it's interactive as opposed to just sort of top down. So haven't really developed it well and no one pays attention to me, but it's something that there are other ways to use it for teaching. Tweetorials can be a good way. So tell us a bit more, soccer tweets. How do we well, find it? <laughs> you can't because I'm the only one who's mentioned it. I had a discussion with one of the hospitalists in the U.S. I can send you a link to the discussion. Because actually one of the things you can do for Twitter is organize things on there and string them together in a set. And so I actually put that together for a discussion as ways to sort of organize teaching. So it's an alternative. You know, there's always the Socratic method. So the idea of Socrates instead is Socratweet. So well done, Matt, for uh, writing this paper and for this whole field of ontology and trying to organize this a bit better on social media. I think that, you know, Twitter is going to be, or iterations of Twitter will be around for a while as a platform for sharing professional information. I think that's why you kids aren't on Twitter either because it's more about in the professional space and news space. I think that's where its strength is. You know, if it wasn't for Twitter, we wouldn't have come together to have this chat today. And how amazing is that to be able to uh, reach across continents and um, be able to put this together? We direct messaged each other on Twitter after Andrew tweeted and Matt interacted and here we are doing this paper. So thank you so much to both of you for coming on, giving up your time. Thank you, Andrew, for pointing the paper out to us. We're always keen if listeners do want to point out good papers. Matt, thank you so much for responding and for coming on the show at this very early time in New Hampshire. So Eva was as the last word to Eva. Would you like to say anything? Oh, look, and this is, I'm just sitting here like with the hugest smile on my face because it's just been amazing, Matt, to have you and to meet you, to see how humble you are. You actually have changed, I'm sure, many, many people's lives with this, but also to heed your warnings about the addiction of Twitter and all the bad things it can do. And we haven't said the C word on this podcast, but, you know, I think it's uh, been a disaster for us controlling COVID. I guess it's a whole other topic. Do you want to have a little word on that, Matt? I think it's an example of what already was potentially an issue before. You know, there's a lot of misinformation that already was being shared in different respects, either around politics or other areas. I think... From a healthcare perspective, the question is how do you cross a public open medium with an area that we're supposed to be committed to privacy? It's a challenge. And so I think we still have to figure that out and learn how to do it well as a skill set for communication that we're just not used to. So I think we can either do scalable good or scalable harm. And I think right now, unfortunately, it's more of the latter. So my hope is we can learn from what we're going through now and find ways to apply it to help ourselves and everyone in society a little bit more. Oh, well said, Matt. And I think you've been a real inspiration. We're all going to follow Andrew's Twitter account and hashtags now, Matt and Craig and I and all of our listeners, including our six in Belgium, hashtag at Hans Prennan. If you're there, thanks, Andrew. Last word goes to you because you really 
gave us the content and the great idea to, well, we didn't invite Matt. He connected with us, which is the beautiful thing. Last word to you, Andrew. Absolutely. No, thank you, Eva. And really thank you to, uh, to Matt so much for coming on to the podcast and, and chatting to us. I think it really just reflects the beauty of Twitter, you know, sort of connecting people across the globe that just otherwise we would never meet, would never interact, never speak. And yeah, I think trying to work out the best way to use this medium to connect when it's been very, very hard to see people in person, in particular in the next, last few years and the coming few years probably to come is really the challenge that we need to work out. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. And don't forget, hashtag OJC. <laughs> <laughs> thanks again. Thank you so much, everyone. So, Craig, now that Matt and Andrew have gone, I have a little confession. Ooh. Matt said that he's going to follow me and not you. No, Here he's is- not saying that. <laughs> he just followed me right now on Twitter. <laughs> Has he followed you yet? Oh, mm, no. Ah, yet. there you go. There you go. So at least for the current five seconds, he's following me and not you. <laughs> it's been a great OJC hashtag, hashtag OJC. We want all our listeners to be using hashtags a lot more. He followed me back. He followed me back. He followed me back. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Anyone else who wants to pick a paper, send a question, and we'll try and find the author to come on for you to meet and directly ask. That's our service here from us to you (laughs) over and out, hashtag OJC. Yeah, wasn't it such great pleasure to be able to connect up with people like that? So we must do some more like this. So if anyone's got great ideas, especially trainees, if you've got some papers that you'd like to chat about and we'll try and get in on the first author to come in on the show as well. So fantastic. Thanks, Eva. Thanks, Craig. You've been listening to the Oncology Podcast. If you enjoyed today's edition and would like to subscribe, head over to our website, oncologynews.com.au and sign up to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.